Welcome, voice friends, to another episode of Interviews on Voice Matters. Today we have Dr. Brad's story with us, and he is a professor in um, the Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences Department at the University of Arizona, and he does computer modeling of the vocal tract and vocal folds. So his research centers on the use of computer models, like I said, to aid in understanding how the shapes, sizes, and movements of both the voice source or the larynx vocal folds and the vocal tract cause sounds of speech. So speech-related and voice-related. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Story. Well, thank you for having me. This is uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really look forward to, to seeing some of your research up close and personal here. Um, the first question I have for you is, how did you get started in voice science? Oh, well, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, I have been interested in, in acoustics and sound since I was a kid. Um, I played guitar, um, and for whatever reason, I was, I've always been interested in uh, professional voices, um, theatrical voices, um, cartoon voices, those kinds of those kinds of things. I never really thought about it as a profession. <laughs> so um, and I, I was also, you know, one of my interests in, in school was was definitely science. And that was the path that I took when I went to college. Um, and I ended up in um, in physics. And I took um, a couple of courses in the during the course of my physics major in acoustics and in vibration. And I thought that, that was really what I was most interested in doing. Um, but there's not a real clear path as to how someone even gets into acoustics uh, because acoustics covers so many different kinds of uh, areas. Um, and if you don't, I've, if you're interested in, in this story, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you the, Please. the story. Um, one of the um, uh, requirements of the physics major that I was in uh, at the time was to do uh, an internship, and at that time it was it was really not a very uh, there weren't a lot of companies hiring interns. And I, I grew up in a very small town in in Iowa, and there happened to be a, a company that had a manufacturing plant in my small town, and, and I happened to uh, know the. Uh, uh, the plant manager and I asked if there was any chance I could do an internship. And it was one of those kinds of internships. You, you just need something in order to fulfill the requirement. Right. Um, and so I, I got a summer job, um, doing, uh, uh, some work on, uh, uh, developing certain aspects of, of an assembly line of all things. Um, one of those projects, however, was to build a, uh, an enclosure for, uh, a big machine that, uh, uh, sheared metal and it was uh it was too loud and um needed to quiet it down so that was my my first acoustics project was to build this acoustics enclosure to to uh limit the sound of this uh of this machine and then i guess you know by by luck or whatever happenstance whatever it might be um there was a project going on at the corporate headquarters of this company in Minneapolis that was um developing a new type of exhaust system for uh, trucks. And uh, I happened to, to meet uh, an intern there who was working on this project. And I met the, the person who was uh, directing that project. And this particular intern was moving on. And that turned into a, a full-time temporary job when I graduated. Um, and so that was really where I learned acoustics, um, was working, developing um, this, uh, this new kind of muffler. And I always, there was one year where I was there. I, I worked there for about four years. Uh, and one of those years, uh, there was a physics professor from a uh, university in Minnesota who came and did a sabbatical at this company because they were developing a, a program, um, where they were sending more students into industry rather than just straight to graduate school. It was kind of an alternative path. And he wanted to come and get some experience and what it was like to, to work in industry. And when he came, he and I worked together every day for, it was probably nine or 10 months, um, working on a computational model of how mufflers, uh, performance of, of mufflers. 
And then I was also working in parallel in a, um, we had a, a anechoic chamber, um, in which, where I was developing a testing method for mufflers. So we were, we had the modeling and the experiment going all at the same time. And I always refer to that as my unofficial master's degree. I probably spent more time with that professor than any graduate student would ever have, um, time with, uh, with any of their, uh, professors that they, they work with at a university. Um, and so that was a, a fabulous acoustics education. Um, so how did I ever get into voice? Um, you know, I, I probably my first interest in this field was in hearing because when you start to work in acoustics, you start to wonder about all of the, how the spectral balance, especially of these mufflers is affecting the perception of what somebody thinks of, of the performance of particular, um, engine or whatever it might be. And so I started to read a lot in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, and I started to think a lot about hearing. But, you know, you never, there are all these kind of weird things that happen when you're young and you're looking for what your next path is going to be. And I, I happened to be at a, a Texas Instruments, um, seminar, which is kind of one of those things that, you know, are offered. They really want to sell things to the companies and you go there and you get a free lunch and you get a bunch of, uh, you know, company information and the like. I was flipping through a book that they had and one of the applications that they had for one of their, uh, signal processing chips was speech synthesis. And I looked at that picture and I thought, gee, that looks just like a muffler. And it looked like everything that we were doing except that they were applying it to, to speech. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. And I kind of locked that away. And I started to read a little bit more about speech and voice, um, also in the Acoustical Society of America Journal. And then one of those issues was a listing of graduate programs in acoustics. And as I was reading through that, I, I saw that, well, the University of Iowa is in here, and there's a person there named Ingo Tietze who does... Um, this kind of acoustics work. And I thought, well, you know, I, I'll just give them a call and see if they're, you know, if somebody with my background would ever be, you know, acceptable in a program in speech, language, and hearing. And I happened to, to call the day after they had been awarded uh, what was called the National uh, Center for Voice and Speech grant. Now, Ingo Tisa still has the National Center for Voice and Speech, but that was the the very beginning of it was actually the, the day that I called to ask about this. Of course. I, I'm not sure that it had even been. Yeah, I guess it was named that. It was officially named then in the grant. And that was a great, at the time, it was a, a great big, what was called a center grant. It was um, really a, a, a wonderful project that brought a lot of researchers together under one umbrella. And a big piece of that was, well, not, I don't know how big it was, but a, a major piece of that was a training component. And so there were, um, uh, there were fellowships uh, built into that grant for uh, pre-doctoral students, and so <laughs> it was a it was a good day to call because <laughs> the department had said, "Well, you know, why don't you come down and visit?" Um, and he was telling me about this grant. So I, I came down probably in a, in a couple of weeks. I was in Minneapolis. I drove down to Iowa City, and you know, I kind of fell in love with the whole idea of of moving out of industry into um, speech, language, and hearing. Um, still, even, even when I, um, went there though, I was, I still kind of wanted to study both speech and hearing. And once I, I got, you know, into a graduate program, you realize you, you can't do justice to both of them. Uh, I still have a lot of interest in, in the auditory system as well, but it was clear that, that, you know, the, the best path for me was to, to follow voice and speech science. And so I started to work with, uh, with Dr. Tietze at that time. And, um, and we've continued to do that ever since. So. And your specialty is modeling, creating computer models of the vocal tract, correct? Right. So my, I, I actually started into the, the modeling. Of course, I, I was doing some modeling with, with the muffler. So I, I had all of the mathematics are really the same, uh, whether you're dealing with, with mufflers or, or the human vocal tract, because really you're just, you're dealing with the, the, the physics of how waves propagate in 
a waveguide or a, an enclosed system. Now there are obviously some some differences. Like we are we have uh, we're fleshy, so we have a, a yielding wall, so to speak, or a soft wall uh, tube, and um, the speed of sound is much different um, because we are at uh, you know human temperature. Uh, and mufflers, of course, are at eight nine hundred degrees Fahrenheit, so that changes the speed of sound drastically. But you know, but but the physics are are really the same. But when I started to talk or uh, work with uh, Ingo Tietze, the first kind of modeling that I was working, that I was pursuing, was actually very different. And that was modeling of the vocal folds themselves, mm. the, vib the vibratory characteristics of the vocal folds. And much of that was was very new and very and, and very interesting as well. And so, kind of the, the beginnings of that are to, to really start historically with um, some of the first models of of the vocal folds, which on the surface appear to be very simple. I mean, you take, you model the vocal folds with a, with a, with a block that you call a mass and you connect a spring to it and a little dash pot that we call a damper and you connect it to a, um, a, uh, a rigid wall and you supply some forces to that and you, you see this mass vibrate back and forth and you kind of get, well, that's, that's exciting. But, um, but then the, the modeling process is, is one of, you're always um, doing this iteratively or recursively is is refining it to make more and more sense relative to the real world. Um, so that was my my first my first foray into the modeling, I guess. Um, and at some point, I guess it must have been in the second year of that of my graduate program, I took um, Ingo Tietze always taught. A course called Acoustics and Biomechanics of Speech and Voice, I believe was the name of it. And in one part of that uh, course, uh, we were going through some of these simple models, and he drew out um, a model that, uh, that had two masses representing the cover tissue of the vocal folds connected to a larger mass that was representative of the body. And they were all connected by the same springs and dash pots. And he made a comment that, you know, no one's ever actually um, uh, put this model together and and see how it, it might work because it represents the body in the cover very nicely. And I thought, hmm, well, maybe I'll try that. <laughs> so that was my that was my first uh, attempt at modeling. So I, I spent a lot of time, um, kind of. Uh, once you commit to a project like that, then you really start to understand the details of all the previous modeling efforts because you have to dig through them. And I, I wanted to do that just to really to get myself up to speed so that I so that I, I had kind of developed my own version of a model just so I understood it better. Um, and that ultimately turned into um, what's become known as the three mass model of the vocal folds that uh, that Ingo and I published in, uh, what was it, 94, I think is when that, that came out. Yeah. What did you start working with, Dr. Tietze? Uh, let's see, January of 91 is when okay. I started the graduate program. And then the three mass model was published in 94. Yes, I, I presented it at the Acoustical Society meeting in Denver in 1992, but um, it wasn't ready for publication at that point. And it took took a while to get it written up, and of course, get through the review process and all that. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, how did how did your vocal fold modeling career turn into vocal track modeling? Yeah, well, that also comes um, from experience. Um, in um, various projects, one one project in particular was um, I was in, in addition to being uh, a student of Ingo Tietze, I was also a research assistant in his lab. And let's see, it was somewhere in yeah, it must have been in 1992, somewhere along in that time frame that he was invited to participate um, in 
I'll call it either a collaboration or a competition. I'm not sure which it was at the uh, Stockholm Musical Acoustics Conference uh, to be held in 1993. And the, the, the setup was that a number of people who did different types of uh, singing synthesis were invited to create different parts of a song. It was kind of a goofy song that was um, written by a man whose name uh, Gerald Bennett, I think is his name. Um, and so he created the parts of, there was a bass and a soprano and alto and, and, uh, a baritone and tenor, of course. Um, and we got the tenor part. And it was, um, it was actually quite a challenge. It was, um, the, the ultimately the song was kind of, kind of a silly song. It, it went some, we had, we had to synthesize this. It was, um, there once was a wonderful wizard who got a fierce pain in the gizzard. So he drank wind and snow at 50 below and blew up a 40 day blizzard. Now, that's kind of a, uh, a funny little song, but it's a tremendous challenge because of, uh, the way in which we do, uh, produce, uh, synthesis is to actually model all of the, um, changes in the shape of the vocal tract uh, over time uh, to produce speech and singing. After this experience, I thought, I think we need to know something more about the vocal tract and how and how how it moves in order for this to to get significantly better. And just to 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 clarify for our listeners who may not know uh, much about voice science in general, the project you were at, or the challenge was to synthesize a human voice and to create the programming. Like you weren't sampling the voice. You were actually creating equations that created the voice. And that led you to believe or led you to realize you needed to know more about the vocal tract. That's right. We were, we were creating this, this song or this part of the song really completely from scratch. Um, we had, we had the musical score. So we had the notes and we had the words and we built it from, from that, from scratch. I mean, it was like, you could imagine it's sort of like a bizarre text to speech <laughs> system, but all of the rules in terms of converting the music and the text had to go through our heads <laughs> and, and through our hands and ultimately to, uh, to changing the files that we had. Um, and so it was, that was a, a, an incredible learning uh, process. <laughs> it was incredibly frustrating at times. Um, but that, that experience really kind of showed me that there was a lot left to, uh, uh, to learn about how the vocal track shape contributes both to the quality of the sound at any given time, but also the complexities of, of the way in which we change the shape uh, of the vocal track. And one of the things that really impressed me about your talk at the PAVA conference last October was how very small, very, very, very small these changes are in the vocal tract to create a completely different sound. Mm -hmm. And so that brings me to my next question. Would you be um, willing to show us some of your current work, like some of the things you're working on right now or thinking about? Sure. Um, maybe... I could, uh, I'll, I'll take you to a little bit of an introduction to the model. So it, there's kind of a visual. Yeah, sure. That'd be great. So just to start, this is, um, really a slide that shows how we get from the, the real speech production or singing production system to a, to a model. So this is, um, a 3D reconstruction of a, um, an adult male who was put into, in this case, a CT scanner. And this is a, a reconstruction of his head and neck. And so, um, and my, is my mouse visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So here's, um, our main, uh, part of, of interest here is, is this is the vocal tract. And so we're just looking obviously at half of the vocal tract so we can see inside it. But oral cavity, of course, is here. Pharynx is here. The vocal folds are, are right. This is one vocal fold right here. And of course, the trachea. This part is the, the epilarynx as we go down in there. Now, what we did is, uh, this was um, part of my, initially part of my, my dissertation at Iowa was to, uh, was to collect a lot of these, um, three dimensional, um, 
image sets of the vocal tract of people producing very different uh, vowels and consonants. And this is um, an ah vowel. And this is the same person. It's really the same set of images, but we um, uh, extract the airspace shape. And so everything over here now has been really pulled out of the, uh, the reconstruction of the head and neck. And so if we take this, now these, see these little wings, those are the piriform sinuses. The vocal folds again would be right there. Trachea is here and the pharynx and so on. If we take that and move it over to here and look at it from the side, now we have um, a sagittal projection of that same shape. Now, the, the three-dimensional um, aspects of, of the vocal tract are really very interesting to look at. But in terms of creating a, a simplified model of the vocal tract, what we can get away with and do a lot with is to uh, just deal with the, the cross-sectional area itself. And so this blue line is a center line that just tracks um, the, the contour, the curvilinear uh, length from glottis to the lips. Then what we did um, um, many times over with a number of different subjects and different vowels is that you take a, a perpendicular uh, oblique section at every point along this blue line, and this is just an example of one of those oblique sections, and measure the cross-sectional area of, of that. And if you do that from glottis to lips, you can lay out those cross-sectional areas here, and that is the area function that I was referring to before. So we represent that as, in most cases for our model, 44 uh, cross-sectional areas that are ordered from glottis to the lips. Now, once we have that, we tend to just replace it with a line and say, well, that, that's what the vocal tract looks like. Well, what we've really done is that uh, we're now representing the vocal tract as a tube. And we can take this blue line, this area function, and remind ourselves that this really is a tube that we're dealing with, and this is what it would look like uh, here, so glottis and lips. Now, um, I'm, I won't spend much time on this, but uh, part of my my dissertation was to develop, a, to enhance a, a model that allows us to propagate the waves uh, through this system, and that's just showing how we concatenate uh, consecutive sections. That's how, how the model is actually built up. Um, then it's also useful to remind ourselves what the anatomy looks like as well. So now we can take this tube shape and project it back onto that center line that we, that we collected before so that things look a little bit more um, anatomical. Now, some people do ask, uh, doesn't the bend make a difference in the sound? And it doesn't really make much difference uh, in the range that we're typically dealing with for speech. Um, the bend is biomechanically very important because it allows us to change the shape very rapidly and very efficiently. But it doesn't make a whole lot of difference acoustically, so that's why we can get away with taking it out. Now, the important thing about that shape is that it has what's called a frequency response. And the frequency response shows us at which frequencies that shape produces resonances. And in this plot, this is showing the resonances of this particular shape. Now, at this point, they're called resonances. Ultimately, when they're uh, when they become expressed in song or in speech, we call them the formant frequencies. But at this point, they're just the resonances of that vocal tract. All right. So, what happens with resonances is the resonance tells us where we have standing waves, and so these animations are showing what the standing waves look like at each of the first three resonances. And so the color changes that you're seeing are showing how the pressure changes from being um, positive to negative, positive being red and highly negative pressure being blue. Wherever it's sort of a greenish yellow means that it's basically just an atmospheric pressure. And if you notice at the lips, that comes close to being atmospheric pressure and most of the time. And that's because about 99% or more of the energy that we generate stays inside the vocal tract. 
mm. and only a little tiny bit gets out. And that's why it looks like it comes almost to atmospheric pressure at the lip end in each of those cases. Now, it's actually, that sounds kind of frustrating, and it sounds really frustrating to a singer that mm. all that sound I'm generating doesn't yet actually get out. But we wouldn't want it any other way because if more of the sound got out, we wouldn't be able to set up the same standing waves. And we wouldn't be able to uh, to modify the, the vocal track shape to enhance the quality of the sound. So that is actually an essential piece. It should It's not a frustration at all, actually. So can you explain the standing wave briefly for somebody who doesn't know what that is? Sure. Um, let's go back to that so they're still live here. The standing wave is the way in which, um, if you imagine, if, if all we had at this end was we injected a little positive pressure pulse, just a little puff of pressure, so to speak, it would travel, if this were a, a perfectly straight tube, it would travel all the way to the end of the vocal tract and it would be reflected. It would hit that end of the vocal tract and it would be reflected as a negative pressure. Whenever a, a little pressure pulse hits an open end of a tube, that open end almost acts like a mirror and it reflects it back as a, a reverse image of itself. That pulse would come back as a negative, but then it will hit this end, which is the glottal end, which for the most part, is, in, as far as an acoustic pulse is concerned, the glottis is mostly closed. And when it encounters a closed end, the uh, the closed end reflects it back, but it doesn't change its polarity. And so it would be reflected back as a negative. That negative then would travel back to the mouth and be reflected as a positive. And then it would come back uh, toward the closed end. At that point, when it comes back to the closed end, that's exactly when a new pulse should be injected into the vocal tract to assist or enhance or reinforce that pulse that's already in there. And that's what happens at resonance or at a standing wave, is that it means that the, the sound coming in is at a frequency that's being reinforced by what's happening inside the vocal tract. Now, that doesn't just happen at one frequency. It happens at many. And that's what we're showing here, is that these th first three uh, uh, resonances are showing that each of them is a standing wave. And so each of those frequencies is enhanced. And over here, we could continue this on to the fourth and the fifth and the sixth as well. And some of those have a big effect on the quality of, of, this, of the singing or the speech. What are some exciting implications for um, what, what you're working on right now? Well, um, I'll, I'll give you two examples. Um, one is, is with respect to singing, and then I'd also, I'll give you an example with respect to speech. It's all based on exactly the same principle, but one is for enhancing quality, the other is for imposing phonetic information on the vocal track. So let's move to here, first of all, just go, so that we're so everybody knows kind of how this this model is is being played out. Um, this is um this is just showing that when, when the vocal folds are vibrating, they produce uh, a glottal flow, which is the source of our our sound. And each of those glottal flow pulses is kind of like acting like like an impulse that then travels through the vocal tract. What comes out is the acoustic waveform or the acoustic pressure, which is exactly what you see when you make a microphone recording. Um, so that's happening in the time domain. We've already talked about the frequency response of our vocal tract shape. But the way in which this all becomes sound is that our glottal flow creates a spectrum with many, many harmonics. That spectrum then is combined with the uh, frequency response or what's called sometimes called the filter function to produce the output. And this is the spectrum of the output pressure. And so this is where we now we finally see the formant frequencies. Those are the regions uh, in the um, spectrum that are enhanced. And so it's 
this combined with this is producing this. Considering that, that this shape produces this frequency response function and those resonances contribute to both the phonetic and the quality of the sound, what we really would want to know is how in the world can we carve that shape? And I put carve, of course, in <laughs> quotes, meaning how do we as humans figure out how to modify that shape to enhance either phonetic or, um, or quality aspects of the sound. So I'm going to take this uh, vocal track shape, I'm going to lay it out as a tube again, and this is its frequency response function. And I'm going to, this is a, basically a neutral configuration. I don't know if, if this will come through or not. I'll play this. Oops. Okay. Well, this is a basically a, a what we would call a neutral vocal track configuration. It's just an ah, ah kind of sound. It's, it's not very interesting. But um, without going into too much of the mathematics here, the, the way in which there is a way that we can relate changes to the shape to the changes that will uh, occur in the frequency response. And we do that through something, through a calculation called acoustic sensitivity functions. And it's a way that takes into account all the information that we know about the standing waves that we saw in the previous slides and kind of packages it up in a way that, that, that allows us to predict what this change will do over here in our frequency response. Mm -hmm. And I won't go into uh, how that all plays out, but basically um, in, a, in a visual sense, we can lay it out like this, is that what's on, on above the vocal track shape now are, are the sensitivity functions that are color coded. And it just tells us that when whenever we constrict a region that happens to have red, the resonant frequency would be shifted upward. And when they're blue, they're shifted downward. And so now we can immediately see that if we want to create an ah vowel, which means that we have to push the second resonance down and the first resonance up, that's typical of an ah, is that what we can do is expand this part of the vocal tract and squeeze this part of the vocal tract. So that's and that that's going to create a, a typical ah-like vowel with a big oral cavity and a, a, a pharynx that's constricted. And now we'll put the sensitivity functions right inside the vocal tract. We're going to try to hit these as targets. And so if we animate that. I'm going to just going to do this very slowly. What we're doing is now creating changes to the vocal tract guided by our sensitivity functions that are going to move those resonant frequencies to the targets that we have established. Mm. Right there. Wow. So this is, um, this is a very simple example of it, but what this allows us to do is to specify a set of acoustic targets and let the sensitivity functions figure out what shape uh, of the vocal tract is needed to produce them. Um, and so this, as you can see, this, this is one way that we can get to, um, doing this for phonetic purposes at the level of, of vowels. But it also allows us to, to play around with some of the upper resonances. Now I'll play these, uh, these are, these are some ah vowels on different notes. We'll see if they come through. Ah, ah. Okay. So that's our, our ah. And now we're going to work on the upper resonances. And one of the, um, one of the goals of um, much of developing abilities to, to sing has been and well publicized as this, the singer's formant or the singing formant. And what that means is a, a really building up energy in the about the 3000 hertz region, at least uh, for um, this would be for typical adult male anyway. So we're going to start now with our ah vowel that we just created. We're going to leave that as it is, but then we want the sensitivity functions to tell us what would we need to do in order to bring the third and the fourth resonance toward 3000 hertz and combine, because that will give us a somewhat of a, a singing format. So here are the sensitivity functions for the, the, the fourth resonance and the third. 
Now, what's kind of interesting about this is that note in the, the front cavity is almost completely dead to the fourth resonance, whereas the epilarynx is almost completely dead to the third. That's really kind of handy because then we can make uh, um, a change back here that will affect the fourth and a change up front that will affect the third. So let's see how that might go. Here is, I'll drag this through very slowly. again. We're going to make some changes to try to bring those together. It doesn't take much. As you can see, we've hardly changed the vocal tract shape and we are bringing those together. And really, by that time, we're about done. And so the dashed line was the original. Oh, wait a minute. I better be careful about that. Uh, yes, the dashed line is the where we started. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the thick black line is now where we've ended. So once you get into creating changes for quality, the changes to the vocal tract shape are very, can be very subtle and very small, but they must be also be very precise in order to make that happen. So this is the kind of thing that we've been, been doing quite a bit of work on recently is, is this idea of sensitivity functions guiding changes to, to the vocal tract shape. Now we can do one more. Um, we've, we've got our F, our third and our fourth resonance together. We're going to start at that point, but really let's see if we can be greedy and bring the, the fifth one down to meet these two as well. So this is the sensitivity for the fifth resonance. And you notice how it gets, we have a lot more stripes now. And the higher you go up in frequency in these sensitivity functions and standing waves, the more stripes you have because you have more um, crossovers of positive to negative pressure in a given standing wave. So here's our slight changes now that we're going to make on this one to bring that fifth resonance down. Mostly, we have a little bulge right here, a little bulge right here, and a little constriction right here. And that'll bring that down. There we go. So now we have a new vocal tract shape. Wow. So if we put all those together, this is where we started with the neutral, and it will go through all of the, the variations that we just looked at. So there's the movement to create the ah vowel, and now we're changing the resonances out here. And then we're back to the, the ah and back to the neutral. Ah. See that the biggest movements are, of course, moving from the neutral to the ah. These are, these quality changes are quite subtle. I'll stop it right there and just go back to the quality changes. Have the ah. All of that, those changes right there is all quality. Mm. Not vowel, not the vowel itself, but the quality of the sound. That's right. Right. So <laughs> this is visual representation of what's happening in the vocal tract as we're training voices, as we're teaching the body to do new movements. And this is this is where it was so fascinating for me is to see how subtle these movements are and how dramatic the sound changes are. So as you as you go through the the audio of this, I'm I'm just setting everyone up to to notice that. Oh, these are the the four changes that we went through, there would be the neutral, we went to the ah vowel, and then we made the two quality changes. Okay. Start with the neutral. Uh. We turn that into this. Uh. Now, I, I also changed the, made, gave it a, a musical note. Okay. And this is the first change we made where the, the third and the fourth resonance were pulled together. Uh. And now the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And also, some of those quality changes might even be note specific because you are going to make subtle changes to, to enhance the note um, as best you can. And in this simulation, I didn't do that. I just I, I kept the same note um, on each of those. And so that would be another potential type of modification that, um, that people could, could uh, produce. Wonderful. Um, getting back to our conversation, where do you see the future of voice science going based on your own research? Um, well, you know, I think the, the work that I'm, that I do is, is really 
working to to enhance our knowledge of how the system works just as a a sound producing device now that that sounds a little cold but um I think that there's so much that we that we still don't know simply on how the uh, the vibration of the vocal folds and it's how it transforms a, uh, a respiratory pressure into a source signal that then is again transformed into vowels and consonants and and sounds that are beautiful mm -hmm. or, or not beautiful for that matter. Um, but I think that, that the work on the, with the vocal tract, um, is, is really exciting in the sense that it gives us a way to get a handle on how a change in the shape can affect, directly affect the output sound. We haven't really had, uh, a way to do that before. And so that, that to me is, is, is a, is an, a kind of an exciting path. The other piece overall, though, I think, and just, in terms of computational modeling of this as a system is that it allows you to play so many what if games uh, without without um, number one being in, trying to do some kind of invasive experiment with, with a person but also it, it it's the perfect platform for doing studies where you you have absolute control over some aspect of the system that you can you can maintain it as being constant then you can go and change something else, the thing that you're interested in. And there's, it's, it becomes so difficult to do that in, with experimentation with real people because we're always adapting to something. That's, that's, that's why we're so good at talking and singing is because we are so adaptive. The problem is that you're, you become adaptive in a lab too. Um, so you never know if you've really, um, controlled, uh, everything that you, you thought you were in control of. Um, but it really, you know, gives us a, a way to understand, um, you know, just answer a lot of questions that have been around for a long time. You know, we, we've done a lot of studies recently just on, on breathy voice and what the effect uh, of um, adduction is on breathy voice or the, or the particular pattern of the mucosal wave on breathy voice mm -hmm. and how, how a breathy voice can actually be modified and changed in quality by a change in the vocal tract shape rather than a laryngeal change. Um, so I think that um, this is kind of a long way to get to um, my final answer. And that is, I think that what we really don't know very much about is how the larynx and the vocal folds and the vocal tract work together as a system. We, we talk a lot about the source and the filter idea how they are independent of each other, um, but we bring them together and they, they both do their thing. But there is a, a lot of, of interaction right. acoustically, aerodynamically, and likely biomechanically that we, yeah. we really don't understand it. And that's that to me is, is a lot of what the future holds, is how all of that works together. So what advice would you give to a young person who's interested in acoustics or voice research? Where would you tell them to go and and how do they get involved in the, the equation, if you will? <laughs> the funny thing about this field is we, we do it in, it, it happens in so many different kinds of traditional departments uh, that there is, there's really nothing traditional about voice and speech science. It's, it brings together so many, so many fields. Um, I always say that's one of the best things about, about being in this field is you get to know something about, uh, you know, physics and engineering and signal processing, but also psychology and linguistics and cognitive science and neuroscience. And the worst thing about this field is you have to know something about all those fields. <laughs> <laughs> or the best thing, depending on yeah, how you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that, and that's what I heard. You, well, Adding on to that, what I heard you say in your original um, story about how you got into your job, your current position, is that you just kept following your curiosity and you kept following the next interesting thing that was happening, the next, um, the the next line in the brochure that caught your attention, and you paid it. You paid enough attention to that that you were able to follow it and create this very interesting um, line of research. 
And you, so you just kind of, you sounds like you followed your intuition and your curiosity to get you to the next place. And I think that's a huge message to share with everyone that life doesn't always follow the, you don't, can't follow a plan always. It's, it's really about staying open to what am I interested in and where is this taking me? Do you feel that way about your own life? Yeah, I, I kind of, I have a, a little bit of a, a running joke with being in a, a speech language and hearing department. Of course, one of the primary goals of many of our students is to get their, their C's, um, three C's, meaning a certificate of clinical competence. Um, I like to change that a little bit and say, I think that the three C's in, in the business of, of really in science in general, but especially in voice and speech science is that you, you need to have as you said, curiosity, creativity, and you need to be able to communicate it. Mm. Uh, those three things um, really can, can move you through a, a field and uh, I think very, very effectively. But with, with those three things, you, you tend to pick up everything else that you, that you need. But those three C's need to always be there uh, in order to, to move forward. And that may be one of the best pieces of life advice I have ever heard. So if you don't mind, I'm going to quote you on that. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it right there. And I think that that's, like you said, the, the world of voice science is so interesting because everyone's in it um, from all disciplines. And, um, and that's why I wanted to do this series was just to talk to interesting people about how they got where they are and some of the things that, that drive them forward. Because I think in the next, as you probably do as well, I think in the next 30, 40 years, we're going to see some just astonishing developments in, in what we know about how the voice works. And, mm -hmm. and you're a huge, huge part of that. So I, I can't say thank you enough for taking the time to give us a, a vocal model lesson, <laughs> literally teaching us about your, your modeling. I, I appreciate that so much. And, and for sharing your story with us, because I think it's going to be inspirational to a lot of people. So. Sure. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. It was fun.